In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, from God, amen. Today, uh, God willing, we'll start a new series on the Orthodox Creed. Um, and before we get into the details of the Creed itself, I thought it would be important for us maybe just to ask ourselves, why do we have a Creed to begin with, and what's the purpose of a Creed, and how um, can we benefit from studying and reminding ourselves of what we believe and why? <clears throat> okay, um, so... Uh, after explain why we need the creed, we'll contemplate, uh, God willing, at the end of this talk, on just the first two words, we believe. Um, or, or in earlier um, versions of the creed, I believe. Um, <clears throat> so um, I thought it might be easy to remember all of the points of why we need a creed um, with the acronym um, of PROMISE. Okay? Um, so uh, let's... So here are the main points of the talk, uh, and hopefully I won't belabor all, belabor all of the different points, but it's nevertheless a good reminder of what the creed um, accomplishes in us and for us. Okay, um, so the first point is that the creed is our pledge of allegiance, or a pledge of the kingdom, as we mentioned in the sacrament of chrismation, when the priest um, or the bishop anoints our heart with the holy oil of God, um, he says, this is an anointing of the pledge of the kingdom of heavens. So because the Christian, the new Christian, is promising and pledging um, to be a member of the kingdom, uh, uh, we are anointed um, uh, with this holy oil. Um, <clears throat> and this pledge sh should be recited, or the creed was recited um, from the earliest um, time that we had the church or versions of the creed um, were recited um, before baptism. Um, and if you remember, if you've att attended a baptism recently, um, the parents or the sponsor um, also uh, testifies or says th this promise or this pledge before God and before the altar, um, because this is the faith that they will impart to um, their ch children. Um, so, um, uh, and in the early days, um, as, as we'll see, the priest would ask, do you believe in the Father? Um, uh, and the, the person being baptized would say, I believe. And the priest would baptize them, I baptize you in the name of the Father. And then they would ask, do you believe in the Son? Um, the, the person would say, I believe. And I baptize you in the name of the Son. Okay, of course, nowadays, the way we do baptism is, is different than this, but it's the same concept. Um, and I'll get more into that, God willing, uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, but the idea here is that there was always a proclamation of our faith. And um, even in scripture, we see these mini creeds or these small versions or summaries of, of what we believe and what we testify to believe. And St. Paul has actually a few of these. For example, um, um, even the St. John the Evangelist in John 3.16 that we know right? Um, that, that was a type of mini creed, or not John 3.16, but there's also 1 Timothy 3.16, where St. Paul says, God was manifest in the flesh, he, he, the incarnation, justified in the spirit, um, seen by the angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. So this is kind of like um, a, a mini version of the life of Christ that we testify to. Um, <clears throat> and also to the Corinthians, St. Paul says, uh, what I received, I gave to you. I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. So this is from generation to generation, right? The passing on of the right faith that Christ died for our sins. So here it's focusing on the death and the beth, burial and resurrection, according to the scriptures. Um, and of course, if you don't believe that, then what's the point of believing, you know, anything that else that the creed teaches us? Because this was the core um, of, of, of the faith. And it was also the core of what the non-believers um, denied. Um, and we'll get to that um, in a minute. <clears throat> so, um, although for the church, um, especially in the early church, early centuries, the, the Bible was rarely questioned. The, the, the authority of the Bible was rarely question, questioned, um, as some historians say. Um, and, but, but the summary of the Bible, or the teaching of Scripture, was summarized in these brief statements of, of faith. <clears throat> and they, the church taught us from, from back then, um, 
especially on feast days or special occasions, to learn and to recite um, these prayers. And eventually, um, the creed developed into what we have um, today. Okay, um, so that's the first point that it's a pledge um, that we make uh, of, of our allegiance to God and the church. The second thing, it's a reminder of what we believe because this is why we, we pray it constantly in the church, not just on the day of our baptism, but every day after that. Uh, and so um, we have to remind ourselves what we believe and why. Kind of like um, one, one of the priests given the example of like when you study geometry, right? You have the question and you're given the answer, but the hard part is trying to figure out why, the proofs, right? Um, and so it's the same idea. Like we have the, the answer before us, we have the creed and we know it, but we need to remind ourselves even why. And this is the, the daily or the regular act of the believer. Um, <clears throat> As one of the Orthodox theologians says, the heart of the message, its central principle, must be identified, its origin from the apostles guaranteed, and the authority established, um, if you compare it with other texts. But St. Cyril of Jerusalem, one of the early uh, church fathers who wrote a lot um, about catechism or the teaching of the new believers before baptism especially, <clears throat> um, he, he wrote this. He says, in order that the soul should not be starved in ignorance, because he says there's other people, um, maybe they don't have time to read too much scripture, for example, um, or they're, they're, they're ignorant you know, in, in some things. Um, <clears throat> the church condensed the whole teaching of the faith in a few lines, like just to make sure at least you get the basics down. Right? He says, this summary, I, and he's telling the people preparing for baptism, you should, commit, you should memorize this. You should, you should both commit this to memory when, when I recite it, and to rehearse it with all diligence among yourselves, not writing it on a paper, but engraving it in the memory upon your heart. I thought that was a very nice quote that he says, like the, the doctrine here, or the faith, it's not just something that we memorize with our mind, but we engrave it in, in the memory of our heart. Um, and that's why it's important still to talk about this, because thank God many of us have memorized this, but um, we need to live the, the faith um, rather than just speak um, of it. Um, and this is uh, what um, our church teaches, a dogma or the faith is what we, is believed, it's taught, it's confessed, it's practiced. Right? It's not. It's the lifeblood of the scriptures, as one theologian says. It's not just, you know, a, a mental act. Um, it is with our whole uh, life that we live uh, this faith. Okay. <clears throat> um, and the the next point is that when we proclaim and when we recite this creed, this is an act of submission to the church, to the holy tradition. Um, and we do it out of love um, and out of obedience. Um, and uh, Saint Athanasius, um, who was, as you know, was one of the um, forerunners um, who helped establish and prepare this creed for us, he says, let us see what the tradition, doctrine, and faith of the universal church from the very beginning, um, what the Lord gave, the apostles preached, and the fathers have preserved. Um, I love this quote very much from St. Athanasius. Um, but then he says, the church is founded on this faith, and if anyone goes against or beyond its bounds, you can't call yourself Christian. Um, so the creed helps put the parameters for us uh, on what, and the church helps put the parameters of what we, we should believe and what, how we should live um, our life. Um, and... Uh, so dogma is not just what is believed, but it, what, it is, what is practiced by the believer. Um, and St. Basil the Great also has a nice quote here. He says, some of the beliefs and practices that are generally received and enjoined by the church are derived from written teaching, but others we have received in a mystery by the tradition of the apostles. So some things we find in scripture, um, a lot of things we find in scripture, which, which are the teachings of the church, but things, some things and practices have been passed from generation to generation through the tradition. Um, and St. Basil is saying this 1,500 years ago or more, right? Um, 
and so back then it was only 300 or so years after Christ, you know, he, and he's saying those 300 years, we, we have passed things on from generation to generation, how much more now? Um, so he says, both of these things have the same validity in relation to the true religion. It's not just what we find in scripture, but we find in the church because the church is the living, uh, the living faith. Um, <clears throat> and he says, no one knows, no one who knows anything about the church and its ways will, will disagree with, with what we are saying. Um, and so, as St. Irenaeus also says, although the church is dispersed throughout the world, even to the ends of the earth, um, there's a common faith. Um, and can you imagine if we weren't obedient or if our forefathers were not obedient to this creed, we wouldn't have it preserved till today. Um, so that's why we have to do our utmost to also be submissive and obedient to, to this holy um, tradition. <clears throat> um, and uh, some fathers say this, this does a harm to the gospel if we're not preserving these um, uh, unwritten traditions. Um, uh, I think it's St. Arrhenius gives the example. He's like, for example, you know, um, where did we find in scripture to uh, anoint the, the new believer with the sign of the cross? Um, where, does the, where does it say to pray to the East in our prayers? There are some verses, but he's saying, um, we learned this by tradition. <laughs> and we'll talk a lot more in depth um, later on the details of the, the tradition, but it's nice to even hear the early church fathers say a lot of things that have been preserved in the church, <coughs> including the creed, was because of submission to the holy tradition of the church. Um, <clears throat> and so the next point is that the creed gives us our map of faith. It gives us our guide um, for this generation, for the generations to come. And some of the fathers call this the rule of faith or the rule of truth. Um, and um, like uh, Tertullian, the scholar says, he says, the rule of faith is altogether one. It's immutable. It's irreformable. Um, it is belief in God. Um, and God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and regarding this, he says the, the rule of faith is constant, whereas other things um, in, in the church uh, can be discussed and debated and reformed, right? But the creed can, cannot be reformed. It should not be reformed because it was given to us, you know, by, um, uh, through the, the holy apostolic teaching from the beginning, Okay. Um, and so here we see, um, we have the creed and, and we extract from it the, the, the life, the life that we have to live according to. So it's our guide, it's our map by which we live according to the faith. Um, and just like you would be a fool to travel throughout a new place without any direction or without consulting any guide or any map, the same thing when we start our, um, our, uh, journey in Christ, we have to have um, a guide. Um, and the church has put one of our guides uh, as the creed. Um, <clears throat> and uh, personally, like uh, almost every person who comes um, to our church to become a new member, um, this is one of the first, if not the first thing that we discuss with them. Um, because if they have any issues with the creed, then we have to go much more slower, much more in detail um, uh, before we can even talk about baptism um, or chrismation. <clears throat> and thank God most of the time they're in agreement with all of these things and we go into the depth of the other mysteries um, in the church. Um, but if anyone asks you what your faith is, this is a very simple answer that we can, we have official statement of faith. Um, we don't have to rewrite <laughs> what we uh, believe. Um, <clears throat> so um, we'll talk again a little more about this, uh, where, how this is the entrance into um, the depth. Um, so this great Bishop Angelos, um, he wrote something very beautiful about this uh, regarding the dogma or the, the faith of the church. He says, dogmas to the Coptic Orthodox Church are not just theological concepts, rather they are in essence our daily experience. Um, which each member of the church should live. Um, 
he continues to say, dogmas representing our faith in God have one message, namely our communion with God the Father and Jesus Christ, the incarnate word of God, by his Holy Spirit. Um, and so um, uh, this, this map um, is, uh, is directing us to being one with God. Um, and the, the church is teaching us like that the faith that we believe with our minds is connected with the faith that we practice um, in, in our daily life, okay? Um, <clears throat> and the next point is that this reminds the Christian of who he or she is. Um, and uh, it's kind of like the symbol or the password that identifies someone as Christian. Like in the early days, um, sometimes just saying Jesus is Lord um, was, uh, was the uh, password, right? Or if you probably uh, heard before, one person would draw the top half of a fish, you know, in, in the sand and the other one would complete it, right? So this was kind of like the secret password. And then they could talk about Christianity <laughs> um, because if you were found to be a Christian or to talk about Christ back, back then um, to the wrong person, uh, you could be killed. Um, so um, uh, I believe this quote here is, um, from Rufinus, we'll see on the next slide, but uh, we'll just read it. He says, although the church is dispersed throughout the world, even to the ends of the earth, it has received this common faith from the apostles and their disciples. And then he goes to, to recite the creed as we know it. And he says, the church has received this preaching and this faith, even though it is scattered throughout the world and carefully preserves it intact as it were living in a single house. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Sorry, this is uh, Arrhenius again. He says, the church believes these doctrines as if it had one soul and one heart, even though um, we're thousands of miles from Egypt or Rome or wherever, um, we proclaim this one faith as if we have, the church has one soul and one heart. And it proclaims them and hands them on in perfect harmony as if it spoke with only one voice. That's the beauty of the unity of the church when we identify with the one faith. Um, <clears throat> he says the languages of the world may be dissimilar, but the message of the tradition is one uh, and the same. Um, and um, so when we proclaim the, the creed, we identify with all the other Christians who believe in the same uh, thing or believe in the same God, right? Um, <clears throat> and vice versa, um, those who don't believe in this, it's easy to point them out. And that, actually, that's why the creed was written um, down in the early centuries, because after a couple hundred years, people started um, speaking or teaching the wrong um, faith. Uh, in the very beginning, the faith was handed down um, uh, from generation to generation, um, face to face, right? Um, but as uh, heresies started to uh, arise, um, the church said, wait a second, we'll have to preserve this by writing it down and from generation to generation to make sure no one makes mistakes again on these very important points, okay? Um, so this is what St. Athanasius used. He says, this is a signpost against heresy is, is the creed. Um, and it was initially written to combat these false teachings. <clears throat> Um, and as St. Peter writes, the Christian has to be ready to be give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, right? So we have to be ready. And if we know the creed well, and we remember it well, when we hear something that goes against the creed, we say, wait a second, that sounds completely wrong because we believe in so, such and such, okay? Um, <clears throat> and this is what happens from when we get our actions. Um, so in the early church, they went from, the, the true Christian faith, um, and they wrote it down because they had to preserve it, right? And then we take that creed and, and we say, okay, let's live according to what was written down. So 
um, the creed helps us um, and the church helps us in general to keep the boundaries in our life in, in the proper areas. Um, <clears throat> so we don't go to the left or to the right. The last point is that, and I think this is probably the most important, um, is that through the right faith, through the creed, we'll be able to enter into the mystery of God, to entry into the mystery of the church, the entry in, enter, to enter into the mystery of the spiritual life. Um, and uh, <laughs> that this is a nice quote because um, some of the fathers were, were reluctant to put down the creed, but they said, they're pushing us to do this because um, uh, it's supposed to be a mystery. We're not supposed to go into the depth and talk about this. We're supposed to live it. But because people are talking the wrong thing, we have to, we have to put this down, <laughs> right? So um, uh, Hilly of, Hillary of Poitiers says, the mischief of the heretics and blasphemers forces us to do unlawful things. What is unlawful? To climb inaccessible summits. Like who can speak about the mystery of God? Who can uh, put down into words who God is, <laughs> right? He says, to speak of what cannot be told, to undertake forbidden explanations, um, like what St. Paul says, um, things which are forbidden for a man to utter. He's like, I, when he got caught up into the heavens and saw the mysteries, uh, he's like, think, I, I can't put these things into words. <laughs> um, he says, it ought to be enough to accomplish by faith alone what we are commanded to do. So just just live according to, you know, uh, trying to get in touch with the mystery of God, but now we have to start writing it down. <laughs> it says, to adore the Father, to worship the Son with Him, and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This, this is the, the, the direction of what must, the, the Christian must live according to. But then he said, but see how we're forced to apply our humble speech to the most unspeakable mystery. This is a very humble way of saying, you know, like, we're, we're, we're we're trying to talk about the mysteries of God here, and the, the heretics are forcing us to. Thank God um, it happened that way, because then we, we, as, you know, uh, beginning Christians, are able to kind of figure out, okay, um, this is the track I'm supposed to be on. Um, so the, the great fathers who were, you know, experts in, in the spiritual life um, were pushed to... to um, reveal some of the secrets or the mysteries of, of, of God. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, this was, this is a formal creed. The formal creed was not initially written down, like I said, by, by the apostles. Um, but the idea here is that we have to believe before we're baptized, before, um, before we go into the sacrament, we have to make sure we have the right faith, okay? Um, and that's why in Mark 16, 16, um, the Lord says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Some people take out the baptized part. Say, okay, um, you're saved because of your faith, right? But we, we, um, we act out our faith in the sacramental life. I'm not going to talk too much about that right now. Um, but the, the point that I want to make here today is that before we get to the sacraments, we have to make sure we have the right faith. And, and when we do and we proclaim that faith, then we could go further into the deep. And um, so this is easy to remember, Mark 16, 16. And then in Acts 16, when uh, St. Paul is in jail in Philippi, um, <clears throat> and um, God frees them by a miracle, um, the jailer um, starts to believe, right? Um, and so he asked St. Paul and, and Silas, you know, what do I do to be saved? So they said, well, first you have to believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Um, but that's not the end of the story. Some people will take this verse and say, okay, see, belief, faith. But what happened actually in, in the story, um, they spoke to the word of the Lord to him. So they taught him the faith, right? Or, or the basics of the faith, right? <clears throat> to him and to his whole house, right? And then they were baptized, right? Um, so again, some people say, oh, can you just baptize me first and then teach me the faith? No, like we have to teach the faith first and then baptize you, unless you're a baby. And then um, we entrust that baby to people who know the faith and who are going to 
basically vow to teach that person the faith, um, which is a big responsibility um, for all of us. So here again, um, is that faith comes, faith, the sacraments and salvation are um, linked, okay? Um, <clears throat> and uh, not only that, but um, like for example, like I said, in, in, the, in the sacrament of baptism, um, we ask the adults, or if it's a baby who's being baptized, we ask the sponsor or the parents, have you believed? Um, uh, or have you believed for them? And they proclaim, I believe. We say this three times to make sure, right? <laughs> um, and then uh, they also proclaim that faith. First, they renounce Satan um, and all his unclean works and all his unclean powers. Um, and then they confess their faith in, in Christ. And it's actually, like I was saying, a mini creed. Um, and then we anoint them and then we baptize them, right? Um, and this is not just done in the sacrament of baptism, um, but every liturgy, right? Uh, at the end of the liturgy, there's the confession of faith uh, done by the priest and by the deacon um, on behalf of everyone. And even um, uh, it's proper for a lot of people. So when, when the priest is distributing the holy mysteries, giving communion to each person, um, he basically says, this is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And the believer uh, who's to receive communion should say, I believe, and then they take communion, right? Because we're saying, yes, I believe this is the holy body. I believe this is the holy blood. Let me receive him, right? So this is kind of like the preparation for going deeper is the proclamation of the faith. Um, and before the climax of the heart comes the climax of the mind, right? Um, that's why when do we proclaim um, the, the creed in the divine liturgy? right before we go into the liturgy of the faithful, right? Because um, <clears throat> you, can't, you can't enter into the mystery. Um, uh, and, and the people who are not baptized yet, generally, they didn't attend the, that liturgy of the faithful. They were not permitted to enter into that mystery. Um, they were only allowed to, to attend the, the, the liturgy of the word, to learn and to grow. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the creed is like, basically the climax of our faith, right? Of pr pronouncing our faith, announcing our faith. And then you get to go into the liturgy of the faithful, right? <clears throat> um, so uh, if you look at every sacrament, if you look at almost every prayer that we have in our church, um, it, it has the same structure. Almost every prayer in our church, we start with the Lord's prayer and the Thanksgiving prayer and sometimes we say Psalm 50, um, uh, but like in the liturgy of uh, the, um, uh, we don't necessarily proclaim that Psalm out loud, um, but there's a creed as well. Um, and among other things, even the marriage, right? Um, so anyway, <clears throat> um, this pr proclamation, I believe is essential um, to go into the depth. Um, <clears throat> And um, one of the fathers says, I believe is placed first in the creed because the apostle Paul writing to the Hebrews 11, six, he says, whoever comes to God must first of all believe that he is or that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those who believe in him. Okay. Um, so we can't come to God. We can't go to the sacrament unless we number one, believe that God exists. And number two, we believe that God is the lover of mankind, or he is the warder, he, he is the one who gives to those who believe, right? Um, <clears throat> this is what St. Paul is saying, right? Um, but, the, but the fathers are explaining this verse by saying, see, this is why we put, I believe, these two words in the beginning of the creed. Um, and also he gives a reference to the prophet Isaiah, also says, unless you believe, you won't understand. He says, therefore, in order for the way of understanding to be open to you, you must first confess your belief. Um, <clears throat> in short, uh, so this is Rufinus, one of the early church fathers. He says, nothing in life can be done unless there's first of all a willingness to believe. It is hardly a matter of wonder then if in coming to God, we first of all profess what we believe, since without belief, even ordi ordinary life is impossible. I like that. Without faith, you know, we can't even live a regular life, you know, um, 
uh, uh, successfully. Okay, and St. Peter of the Great also says, let faith in the teachings about God prevail, faith and not proof. What is the difference? He says that this is the faith that leads the mind toward assent more than the rational arguments do. Uh, the faith that is born not of mathematical necessities, but from the inner workings of the Holy Spirit. So here, when we say we believe in this, it's, it's basically kind of like what we were saying, the obedience or the submission to God. And say, we're telling God, you know, send your Holy Spirit to work in me that I may grow in living according to the, this faith that I am proclaiming. Okay. Um, so um, we'll go uh, further into the depth next time, but I just wanted to bring up one point is um, we begin the creed with one with we believe because this is the essence of our religious convictions. And it depends not on our external experiences, but on our the, the God-given truths that are given to us or revealed to us um, by God. Um, and what we believe affects our whole life um, and our whole person. And it's, it can't be just, we can't just say, oh, that person is very sincere in what they believe. God bless them. Well, I mean, for example, like Hitler was very sincere in what he believed, but that didn't make him a good person. That didn't make him uh, saved right? The most trouble in the world is caused by people who have strong convictions, <laughs> right? So the question is not, are you, uh, do you have a strong conviction? Is, is what do you believe in? Uh, and the second point is that we can't believe and, and love God with all our mind, heart, and soul unless we know who he is and uh, we love him with, with our mind. Um, <clears throat> and so worship here is based on faith and faith is based on our knowledge of God. And so that's why we teach. That's why we learn. That's why we study, is so that we fill our minds with knowledge of God, and then we love that God whom we begin to know, little by little. And that love is proclaimed in our worship. <clears throat> okay? So we can't just say, oh, let me just pray, but studying is not for me. Or reading scripture is not for me, but I'll just pray our Father. Um, or uh, I'll pick and choose what I believe in, in the faith. No, no, we have to proclaim every, the church says, okay, accept this um, 100% or not. Of course, I'm talking about the creed. I'm talking about the dogma. There's some other things that are, like I said, you know, debatable and d discussable, um, but there's some things we have to accept from A to Z without question. And the creed is definitely one of those. Um, <clears throat> and um, the other thing is, once we find the truth, don't, don't go looking for other things. Um, the, the scholar Tertullian, he said, um, you can't go for on forever looking for something that has already been taught as the one truth. Um, you have to seek until you find it. And when you find it, you have to believe it. <laughs> I like that. He's like, after that, you know, there's, in a matter of speaking, he says there's nothing else to worry about. Of course, there's a lot of things to worry about in our spiritual life, but here he's talking about searching for the truth. We have it, thank God. <laughs> and once you find it, you, you, cleave, you cleave to it, and you try to live according to it. Um, and these beliefs should change our life for the better. Um, and the truth in our life affects how we live our lives. Um, like, for example, um, and I'll kind of... Uh, <laughs> uh, conclude with this but for example um if i told you um you were formed by accident in a petri dish how would that change your understanding of god or if i told you your parents were forced to have you or to be or, or be killed and they didn't really love you um how would that affect your relationship with them right i mean god forbid of course this is not true but you can see how if something um uh, that happened a long time ago um, that you, you realized later, and whether it's true or not, like if it changes the way you look at things and, and it changes your relationship with people and it cha changes your relationship with God. So that's why the, the faith is important. And the, the origin or what is true is very important um, in how we relate to God and to others. Okay, so these truths belong 
in our um, daily life. It b belongs in our religious experience with, with God, and it belongs in our relations um, with others. So the more we understand God, who he is, how much he loves us, what he has done for us, how he created the world and continues to be involved in our life, what he is preparing for us, um, our relationship with him changes. Our lifestyle has more of a purpose. Um, our um, daily life is transformed. Um, so this is based on faith and the faith is based on understanding and the understanding is based on what we have learned um, through the church um, from God. Okay, um, so uh, finally, just kind of like to clarify, some people say, well, is it we believe in one God or is it I believe? Actually, both are correct. Um, for baptisms in the early church documents, we see that it was I because the person has to take um, uh, a personal acceptance of this faith. But after that, we become a member of the church, like when we say our father, um, we say it collectively because now we are a member of the universal church. Um, and it's not more of a personal of opinion, what we believe. We're not entitled to a personal opinion when it comes to the dogma of the church, right? Um, <clears throat> so this, this is kind of like a reminder of what we were saying before of our submission um, to, to the uh, authority of, uh, of the holy tradition in the church. So... Um, God willing, in the future talks, we'll go part by part into the important parts of the, the, the creed of faith, um, using the Holy Church Fathers as, as a guide for us. Um, <clears throat> and this reminds us of our promise, our pledge of obedience, our map, our identity, helping us to avoid the sign points of, uh, signposts of heresy and being, allowing us to enter into the depth and the mystery and the mysteries of Christ. Um, <clears throat> so may God give us his grace and give us the ability um, to go deeper in the understanding of the faith so we could go deeper in our Christian uh, uh, struggle. And glory be to him now and forever into the age of all ages. Amen.